Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome and uh, good evening. My name is Nell Pepper. And on behalf of Harvard Bookstore, the Harvard University Division of Science and Cabot Science Library, I am so pleased to introduce this virtual event with Susie Shi presenting her book, The Matter of Everything, How Curiosity, Physics, and Improbable Experiments Changed the World, in conversation with Greg Keston. Thank you so much for joining us virtually tonight, uh, especially uh, for this rescheduled um, event. Thank you so much for joining us. Tonight's event is the latest installment in our Harvard Science Book Talks series, which works to bring the authors of recently published literature, excuse me, recently published science literature to our Cambridge University and beyond. To learn more about our other upcoming events, you can visit harvard.com and sign up for our email newsletter, or you can check out the page harvard.com backslash science for the science talks schedule. I'll also be posting a link in the chat to our science research public lectures YouTube channel where you can view previous talks that you might have missed. This evening's discussion will conclude with some time for your questions. If you have a question for our speakers at any time during the talk tonight, you can click on the Q&A button on your screen and we will get through as many questions as time allows. This event also has closed captioning available. Depending on the version of Zoom that you are using, you may need to enable captions yourself by clicking on the closed caption button on your screen. In the chat, I will also be posting a link to purchase copies of The Matter of Everything on harvard.com. Your purchases make events like tonight's possible and help ensure the future of a landmark independent bookstore in Harvard Square. So we all thank you so much for your continued support and tuning in, not only in support of our wonderful speakers and authors, but also in support of the fabulous booksellers at Harvard Bookstore. We all sincerely appreciate your support now and always. And uh, finally, uh, as uh, you well know, technical issues may arise. We, of course, hope that they do not. But if they do, we will do our best to resolve them quickly. We thank you so much for your patience and your understanding. And now I am delighted to introduce our speakers. Dr. Susie Shi is a physicist, science communicator, and academic who divides her time between research groups at the University of Oxford and University of Melbourne. She is currently focused on developing new particle accelerators for applications in medicine. The Matter of Everything is her first book. Greg Keston earned his physics PhD from Harvard, focusing on theoretical particle physics and quantum field theory. He is currently part of the Harvard Physics Department faculty as the Associate Director of Science Education and as a lecturer on physics. Over his career, he has conducted research in nuclear physics, particle physics, fusion energy, gravitational wave physics, and science education. And as a digital producer at Nova PBS, he created award-winning media from documentaries to educational interactives to his original video series, What the Physics. They will be discussing Susie Shee's new book, The Matter of Everything, How Curiosity, Physics, and Improbable Experiments Changed the World. In the book, Accelerator Physicist Susie Shi discusses 12 experiments which shaped our understanding of the cosmos and how we live within it. The Guardian praises Shi's journey through the history of particle physics reveals the extraordinary ingenuity of experimental scientists and their selfless dedication to answering big questions about matter and the universe. I am very pleased to turn things over to our speakers. The digital podium is yours. Greg and Susie. Thank you so much. We'll just wait for Greg to come in. <laughs> um, well, I'm I'm very much looking forward to hearing um, your initial presentation, and um, after that, uh, we'll get into a conversation about the many interesting things in the book. So, uh, Susie, I'll, I'll let you start. All right, let's go. Just share my screen here for a second. that in play mode there we go all right so um as Nell was saying um the 
book that I'm talking about, The Matter of Everything, is kind of a an adventure of and discovery um, in physics. Uh, so what I've done in writing this book is create a journey um, through these 12 key experiments over about 120 years, starting with single room labs, um, like the one in which x-rays were discovered in 1896 through to the enormous particle colliders and collaborations like the Tevatron and the Large Hadron Collider. Um, and through these stories, the idea is um, that we experience what it's like to be a physicist and how they overcome these immense challenges from the craft of glass blowing, um, rewriting all their intuitions about how nature works, um, and eventually mastering international diplomacy all in the name of discovering more about our universe. And the story that emerges is one of experiments leading to discoveries and innovations, which have given us a vast amount of our modern technology from cancer treatment to the World Wide Web. And rather than try and fit all 12 experiments in one talk, I thought as an intro, I'd like to share five sort of themes and ideas that came um, from writing the book, um, along with a couple of the little stories um, that happened throughout. So the first thing I'd like to share with you is the idea that how we know is just as important as what we know. Um, as Nell said in the book, I celebrate experiments. Um, and to my surprise, it seems that experiments are massively under-celebrated in physics and popular culture. Most physicists, not all, but most, come in sort of one of two flavors, either a theoretical physicist who whose focus is on developing new conceptual ideas, usually using mathematics like Albert Einstein, Werner Heisenberg, or Max Planck. Um, but experimentalists, on the other hand, have a sort of more nuanced job. Um, while they have to understand the mathematics, they also have to be willing to sort of go beyond it and rely on practical skills, physical insight, and a whole lot of persistence. Um, experimentalists, for the record, are in no way inferior to theorists, and I don't just say that because I am one. Um, but we can't know anything at all about the real world without actually getting in there and conducting experiments. And there's kind of two ways in which experiments can lead to new discoveries. And the first is the one that you're probably a bit more familiar with, which is where a theorist puts out an idea or a theory and predicts something and an experiment is designed and conducted to kind of confirm or deny or find evidence for or against that particular theory. So a recent example of that would have been at the Large Hadron Collider in uh, on the border between Switzerland and France, the idea of testing the prediction of the existence of the Higgs boson, the particle that sort of underpins the mass of other particles in our theories. And this was first predicted by three guys, Brout, Englert, and Higgs. Um, and it took decades, thousands of people, billions of dollars to build the experiment, the Large Hadron Collider, which discovered the Higgs boson in 2012. Now, the three guys who predicted it, the theorists, got the Nobel Prize, but the experimenters, I bet you can't name a single one of them. Now, the second way that experiments can give us new knowledge is a more serendipitous route. So when experiments produce results that aren't predicted in advance. And doing this kind of experiment requires the ability to ask good questions and persistence and a whole lot of luck. Um, and we tend to celebrate those who got lucky. But within the stories in the book, I also want to celebrate just those who got in there and did the work in the first place. So like in 1897, when J.J. Thompson asked a pretty good question, which was, what is the nature of cathode rays? And he realized that to understand if the rays inside these glass tubes um, were particles or a form of light, he had to establish whether or not they carried electric charge, whether or not they had a mass. And he undertook a series of really clever experiments and overcame the problems that previous experimenters had had um, to establish that, in fact, cathode rays were tiny charged particles, the first subatomic particles, which we now call electrons. Now, within a couple of years, Thompson had actually explained the physics of how electrons flow out of electrodes and into the glass vacuum tubes, which turned out to be exactly the knowledge that engineers needed to create vacuum valves, amplifiers, and other devices. And this actually gave birth to the entire electronics industry, radio, telecommunications, computers, the whole lot. And without these electronic valves, based on the theories that Thompson developed through his experiments, even rock and roll would never have happened because we wouldn't have had those beautiful amplifiers. Which brings me to my second key point, which is that the results of curiosity-driven research grow in usefulness 
over time. So not just Thompson's, but there's many other examples. That's because new discoveries make new imaginings possible and can lead us to new creative and innovative ventures. So curiosity-driven re research tends to, f to lead to fundamentally, sorry, to fundamentally new ideas, um, and those compound in utility over time. So like in 1896, when Willem Röntgen, working in Germany, um, discovered X-rays when he saw a glowing screen across his lab and decided to investigate, leading to this iconic image in the middle of his wife's hand. And who'd have thought just two weeks later, artists would already be using the same technique to take X-ray photographs of an iguana on the right there, and that doctors very quickly started to use them, use X-rays to see inside patients' bodies without a single incision in the skin for the first time in history. Over time, though, X-rays became even more useful as they were combined with other ideas. So from astrophysics to hospitals to border security to industry, they just found more and more uses in our society. And sometimes these curiosity-driven results come from unexpected directions, like Charles Wilson's cloud chamber. Um, initially, he designed it to study meteorological effects, like light on clouds, but it actually became the first particle detector, enabling discoveries of new particles, like muons, the heavy version of the electron, or positrons, which is the antimatter version of the electron, which completely transformed our understanding of what matter is and how our universe works. And today we even use these. So we can use muons to look inside volcanoes and pyramids and even positrons, antimatter, is used in hospitals in PET scanners. Then this path to new ideas is often nonlinear or serendipitous. And what's important here is not that we know in advance where this kind of research will lead. Otherwise, it wouldn't really be research. What's of value here is simply our desire to know and our willingness to actually do the work to find out. So this brings me to my third point, which is that science might be objective, but scientists definitely are not. Um, now, physicists, contrary to many pop culture representations, we're only people, right? We're limited in our capacity to imagine. We're subject to groupthink, egos, biases, all the other vices that everyone else has. But we've had to work really hard to overcome these biases in our methods. Um, but these biases are the reason why at the turn of the 20th century, we get things like this, where many physicists thought that their work in physics was done. So Albert Michelson says, it seems probable that most of the grand underlying principles have been firmly established. And Lord Kelvin in 1901 says, the future truths of physical sciences are to be looked for in the sixth place of decimals. Yet what came after was a complete revolution in our understanding from the unstable nature and inherently em inherent emptiness of atoms uh, to the ideas of quantum mechanics. And it's hard to predict the future because our imaginations are limited by our current theoretical ideas and by technological capability. So here's another one from Lord Kelvin, who seemed to get quite a lot wrong, that he thought neither the balloon, the aeroplane or the gliding machine will ever be a practical success. So physicists are not immune to being bad at predicting the future, right? Now, some ideas, though, in physics seem so out there that they actually take a long time to be accepted by the community. So one example in the book is um, experimenter Robert Millikan, um, who was not alone in dismissing the early ideas of quantum mechanics, which he called a reckless hypothesis. And he actually spent 12 years in the lab doing experiments to disprove Einstein's theories on an effect called the photoelectric effect all the while gathering the most precise data yet that showed that actually Einstein and quantum mechanics were right. And the way we've found through this is to really cultivate a culture of curiosity and to cultivate these methods to overcome our biases and be open to the idea that we might be wrong. So the fourth key idea is the question, who gets to be a physicist? Surely we need, in these really difficult problems, the best and brightest minds. Curiosity is a human trait and it isn't inherently racist or sexist. But sadly, for most of the history of science, we have been limiting who can contribute to this amazing field, which is totally our loss. Um, now, when I earned my degree in physics and even in doing the research for this book, I couldn't help but notice that there was a strong great white man narrative of science happening in the history of my field, um, yet there were women working in the field. 
Um, and I found a lot of them in my research, amazing scientists like Harriet Brooks, who's in the middle here, working with Ernest Rutherford in Montreal in the early 1900s, whose experiments helped us understand that radioactive elements can change or transmute into one another. Or Marietta Blau, working in Austria, whose unique background in both photographic techniques and physics allowed her to create a new type of particle detector known as a photographic emulsion that led to countless discoveries and won a number of other people Nobel Prizes, but not her, even though she was nominated numerous times. And even Indian physicist Biba Chowdhury, who I'd never heard of before I wrote this book, um, whose first authored Nature paper on her discovery of two different new particles wasn't enough to clinch her the Nobel, which went to a man a few years later for almost the same discovery, albeit he had better equipment. Now, these stories are not isolated. Women have always been interested in physics and have always made amazing contributions, but they have been discouraged, shut out, and had those contributions overlooked or attributed to their male colleagues or even relatives. And our society today tells us that women don't look like physicists because we don't have the stories of women physicists who went before. And this isn't a few isolated instances. It, it actually has a name. It's called the Matilda Effect, named by science historian Margaret Rossiter after Matilda Gage, who was a suffragist who first realised that women's contributions are often overlooked and neglected. And Margaret Rossiter encouraged all of us to find these stories, include them in the main narrative of our his histories. And so that is exactly what I've tried to do in this book. And our fi my final sort of key idea that really comes through these 120 years of stories is that collaboration is really a human force of nature. The problems we're facing today are too large for a few individuals or companies or even a single nation to solve. And what the story of these amazing discoveries that we've done in particle physics against all odds tells us is that really we need to learn how to work together. Um, in the book, we start with stories of collaboration across disciplinary boundaries, say with medicine, which transformed um, that field. Uh, but then uh, later on, we learn about collaborations that happen across national borders as well and across different institutions. And this particularly happens after World War II, um, when many European countries were financially decimated by the war. And the scientists who were living there realised they couldn't go after these big questions unless they learnt to pull their resources together and work together. And so um, in Europe, they actually founded, sorry, I'm going to skip that one, they founded CERN, the European Laboratory for Particle Physics in 1954, with the remit of Science for Peace, because they realised that by creating a common project to pursue peaceful scientific goals, it might have the effect of bridging some of the divide between the countries who ratified this, some of whom had previously been at war just a few years earlier. Um, now CERN is now home, as we know, to the Large Hadron Collider. It was the birthplace of the World Wide Web and many other inventions, and is really now a hotbed of discovery and innovation. And I think what this shows us is that the power of collaboration, of learning to work together towards something greater than ourselves, is really one of the key things that we can do as humans to solve difficult problems in the future. And nowadays, CERN even teaches the UN how to collaborate. Um, so those are the five key ideas uh, that I wanted to bring to you today from the book. Um, and yeah, I'm open to many questions. There's so many stories that I would love to share with you, but let's see how, how much we can fit in the time available. <laughs> that's, that's great. Thank you, Susie. Um, so we'll, um, we'll ha leave the end last uh, 10, 20 minutes uh, for questions. And, uh, and, but before that, we'll, uh, we'll have a conversation. But so let me start by saying, I, I love the book. I have it. I have it here with me. Um, and, um, Oh, you have it as well. Matchy, matchy. Uh, <laughs> um, so, um, uh, you know, I, I like in your presentation, the, the story that you tell of um, many of the, the stories in the past of sort of some singular theoretical physicists were the type of, of books that many people, my friends, I read growing up, Einstein, Feynman, Heisenberg. Um, so this was a really unique, refreshing look at uh, not just focusing on experimental particle physics, but um, just looking at the characters and the technological breakthroughs, the applications, and, and a lot of the adventures that the, the experimentalists went on. Um, 
you know, it was really interesting to learn that some of the discoveries and technological advances are helping us today understand SARS-CoV-2. Um, you know, it it, it uh, led to the technology we use in MRIs. And um, I was uh, very excited to learn that Rutherford, uh, and I'm quoting uh, the book here, uh, had a deeply held belief that swearing at an experiment made it work better. So, <laughs> and given you know, his results. <laughs> yeah, it seems like it works. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, I, I, you know, learning about these characters was, was very um, insightful for me and I strongly recommend it I, I, to others. So uh, check it out. I think the link, the link is in the, um, the chat for the book, um, from the bookstore. Um, so I thought uh, we'd start with something from both the beginning and the end of the book. Um, so you shared this quote from Albert Mickelson. Uh, it, it, it seems probable that the most, that most of the grand underlying principles have been firmly established. Um, and so, uh, you know, in the modern particle physics, the standard model, of particle physics is pretty firmly established as well. And so um, what I wonder is if you think, you know, physicists of today might say so something similar and um, if there's something qualitatively or quantitatively different now from then, and, um, and maybe, maybe you could just start by giving people a sense of what people thought of physics back in 1894, what was matter? What was light? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, sure. So, I mean, we still had this idea that matter was composed of atoms, which were the smallest building blocks. We knew about gravity and we knew about electricity and magnetism, um, but we didn't know that there was even a nucleus in the atom. So we didn't know anything about any of the nuclear forces. So, for example, we couldn't explain how the sun shines or, you know, even sort of the evolutionary processes of the universe or uh, we sort of thought that... Uh, light we knew that there was light was a spectrum in the visible sense i think we had already discovered um ultraviolet and infrared but had no idea uh or, or only really discovering and working with the idea that um electromagnetic radiation went well beyond that um and even you know x-rays being a high energy form of light so it was a pretty deterministic view of the universe as well like almost a clockwork version where you could put in all the parameters and you know wind a you know do all the calculations and calculate how everything was going to be forever and yet there were some pretty obvious gaps in that one of which how the sun shines is is pretty uh you know was a pretty big one um and even you know questions like the age of the earth and the age of the universe were, would have been very difficult to attempt to answer at that point they would have to approach it through something like thermodynamics for example um so what happened through these key experiments um and a, a number of them are in the early stages of the book so things like the discovery of the electron in x-rays the discovery that the atom has a nucleus the first ideas of quantum mechanics and this idea that light itself might be composed of quanta or particles um starts to really break down this existing finished view of physics in in the universe and what emerged out of that was way more complexity and, in my view, beauty um, than we ever conceived of. So by the mid 1940s, you know, sort of 1940s to 1950s, we're starting to discover just loads and loads of new particles as we developed the experimental tools to do so and discovered cosmic rays raining down on us from space. And within those was, you know, pions and muons and positrons and strange particles, which I talk about in the book and all these other exotic things. And then the work really is to get in there and do that in a predictable enough way that you can study these things in detail to try and figure out, well, is there an underlying structure? How do the forces inside the nucleus work, et cetera, et cetera. So that's really the big adventure that we go on. And then at the end of the book, basically from the 1970s onward, we get this standard model of particle physics, which is the one that most of the books out there in particle physics are going to tell you all about um, while they neglect the experiments. Right? <laughs> but this is, you know, the theory that brings together all of our current understanding of the strong and weak nuclear force electromagnetism um, and it doesn't include gravity which is a bit of an oversight um, and so we have this theory and it can predict what happens in our particle colliders to like one part in a billion like that's an incredibly precise um, thing and even at the large hadron collider 
the prediction of the Higgs boson was within that theory. So that was kind of finding the final piece. And what we really want to find then is physics that goes beyond that. Now, we have really compelling reasons to know that there's physics beyond that, right? So we now understand from cosmology and from galaxy rotations that we think that the matter and all of the stuff that we discover in this amazing journey in the book is only about 4% of the mass energy content of the universe. So the rest is something called dark matter and dark energy. And so at the moment, there's this huge question mark of uh, what that stuff is and you know, how it works in the universe. Why is it that we can't seem to sort of see it here on Earth? And that's the current challenge, I think, is to understand that. And to me, that's a parallel point almost in history of like, well, it feels like we're done with physics because we have this amazingly predictive standard model of particle physics that we can't even seem to break with the Large Hadron Collider. And yet we know there's more. So to me, it's almost... And, and I say this in the book, it's almost a new period where we get to throw out theories at a rate that we haven't seen in a long time because we're excluding their predictions based on what's being measured in the current experiments. That to me is a really exciting period in the history of physics because it sends us back to the drawing board. Both the theorists and the experimentalists have the experimentalists have to look out for things they weren't expecting and the theorists have to go back and go, well, is there another way that this all might work? Yeah, it, it's exciting to think that over 90% of, of matter is just not understood. Right. Um, like the potential in that is just, you know, I still hold out hope for, you know, one day we'll get to the point where we understand things well enough that we can have, you know, interstellar uh, travel and stuff like that. Like maybe we're just, maybe we're just limited in our imagination by by what we know now. <laughs> oh, I'm there with you. Yeah, I, I want to go to other galaxies. What are they like? Um, right. <laughs> they might so, kill us, but... <laughs> yeah, well, you, know. you, you always take that risk. Um, so um, you, you described how this evolution of how with uh, uh, Wilhelm Röntgen, he, he was working pretty much alone, I guess his mm. wife lent a hand. Um, and then we get to Rutherford working with um, Harriet Brooks, Frederick Soddy, and now there's a few people. And then as the experiments grow, the number of people, we finally get you know to the Higgs. Now there's thousands of experimentalists, mm. which, um, you know, if Rutherford's running it, that's a lot of people cursing at a single experiment. Um, <laughs> but um, so uh, my question is, do you think that the future discoveries in particle physics, say, um, are going to come out of these big collaborations? I mean, is there still uh, going to be discoveries out of some sort of tabletop small lab experiment? That is a huge question right now, because yeah, both, both are happening um, and both are important. And it's also an interesting thing also about choosing as a scientist like well where am I best suited like do I enjoy being part of one of these big collaborations um, I have colleagues here in Australia for example who were part of the Higgs boson discovery part of the Atlas experiment at CERN and they still work on it a bit but I tell you what those 4am meetings with CERN get really old really quickly <laughs> so like does your lifestyle allow you to uh, to do that so instead they're now building um, a dark matter detector experiment the first one in the southern hemisphere um, and that means that they'll be able to sort of run their own experiment but then that's still a collaboration with other similar experiments around the world it just means that you know like almost lifestyle wise that's the way but of course we don't always just choose what we do based on lifestyle that's why they were doing the 4am meetings in in the first place um and the question is physics wise you know do we need both of these approaches and i would say that the consensus among most particle physicists is absolutely yes and i think part of making those smaller and either more specific experiments or you know easier to easier to build and and, and um, analyze experiments is to try and have this broader view of like, is there something out there that we haven't um, thought about or seen before? And there's all sorts of um, interesting experiments, even over in other areas like condensed matter physics that might have an impact on our understanding of particle physics or cosmology eventually, because at some level it's physics, it all, it all is interrelated, right? Um, but it tends to be that to have the greatest reach in terms of energy especially you do need these big collider experiments 
Um, and then to also have the greatest flexibility in terms of what you're looking for to sort of, again, have that broad sweeping view. You do need to be able to adjust parameters as much as possible, um, have these multi-purpose detectors that we that are built at places like the Tevatron and the Large Hadron Collider. And then you have to have many people looking at many different aspects of those questions. So I think there's a place for both of them. Um, even if we were to find something exciting in a small experiment, you would probably still need to build one of the major colliders in order to understand it precisely. Um, and so that's that's kind of where we're at at the moment also is that there's, um, yeah, there's a push towards the next big machine being a sort of precision machine using electrons and positrons to really delve into the details of our knowledge of various interactions. Um, but yeah, it, it is uh, it is a personal choice, I think, as a physicist, how you work on that. But one of the things that people don't realize is that like, if you're a part of one of these big collaborations, you're not just there with thousands of other people in a Slack chat or something, right? Um, <laughs> you tend to work still in these small groups and it tends to be groups between about 10 and 20 people within an institution or a university environment, because that's the kind of size where you can know everyone and work productively directly together. And then those small groups choose which aspects of the problem they work on or contribute to, join up with other groups, and then together, you know, it is sort of there's a, a cascade of um, contributions that then uh, sort of go up. So when I say there's thousands of people working on these experiments, they're still, you know, there's still substructure to the thousands of people. Yeah. Yeah. You describe how there are, you know, there are engineers, there's people working on the detectors, there's electricians, you know. Oh, it's so specialized. The, yeah. 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 So, <laughs> yeah, I mean, it, you know, the, the technology that's needed is, is so advanced that um, even if they're not there with you, these thousands of people are not in a room together. Um, in, in some ways they are with you. Yeah. And, and actually the thing that really binds them through that is like they have to trust each other, right? Like they have these bilateral agreements and they have all these commitments and things like that. But at the end of the day, yeah, that glue and the collaboration is being able to trust that the other physicists also care enough about these big goals that they are going to pull their weight and deliver their part. Because if if one part isn't delivered, you know, the thing doesn't work. <laughs> so, um, so, yeah, it's it's. And, and that, I think, is where that power of collaboration and international diplomacy really comes in, is this idea that, like, we can't force you to do your part, right? But we're going to trust you to do your part. And that's really the glue that binds them together. Mm. Um, so you, you mentioned um, in your presentation um, some of the stories of uh, women scientists uh, that don't appear in some other histories um, of, of physics and history of science. Um, now, there, you mentioned uh, Harrietta Brooks' contribution to the discovery of the nucleus. Um, in the book, you you mentioned uh, Helen Edwards' work at um, Fermilab, uh, yep. Lise Meitner. Um, and so I I was wondering if there's maybe uh, one of these stories that 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 stands out to you, or maybe um, some lessons that um, we can draw from these stories. Maybe you want to talk a little more about it? Yeah. Yeah, sure. Yeah, I mean, there's many uh different stories I think one of the the one that jumps out at me the most because I was so amazed I hadn't heard of her was was Harriet Brooks and um so she's also the earliest story in the book of, of a woman within that team and I, I didn't say it in my opening piece but what actually happens with her is she makes these amazing contributions and then um and she was Rutherford's first graduate student actually and then she gets engaged to be married and then she's told that um if she gets married, she's going to have to quit her job and quit physics. And so to her credit, she quits the engagement. <laughs> she uh, she breaks off the engagement and wow. she continues working in physics. Wow. Now, I mean, that doesn't that tell you something about her character and determination to, to do the work? And this is given that she comes from a family of seven different, seven children. And so she already needed scholarships and things to cover her. Like her family couldn't afford as a girl for her to do this work. So she's living in financial scarcity at that point in time. And clearly marriage was the way that most women solved that problem. And yet, um, and yet she chooses to continue with physics, which is just a level of passion for their work that I think most people can't even compare to. So, so she goes on, she actually goes to the UK. She goes and works with Marie Curie for a bit. Um, and then she re reaches the age of about 30, which, you know, in the early 1900s is old for a woman to not be married and have children, right? Uh, 
And so then she has to have make a decision again because um, one of her former tutors in Canada starts courting her from abroad. And then Rutherford uh, has moved to Manchester and starts um, wanting to get her there as a research fellow. And he writes this amazing reference for her, describing her as the most you know, preeminent woman in radiation physics after Marie Curie. And you know, she's clearly really, really good. Um, and so she has to make the decision between, you know, a sort of relatively solitary life without, you know, having a family and children and going on in physics or to return to Canada and take up this uh, offer of marriage and um, and uh, and leave physics. And so that is, unfortunately for us, that's what she chose to do was to go back to Canada and have three children um, and, and leave physics. And I think there's a couple of things that I took away from this and even in my experience today I know many women my peers who I studied with people who I did PhD with who've actually had exactly the same decision to make and often it is one either based on financial scarcity and or security or the societal pressure of um, wanting to sort of have it all wanting to have the family and the kids um, as well as having the career and just realizing that it's not possible often for, for many people and choosing to step out away from a thing you love in order to pursue another thing that that you really want to experience in your life and what I learned from this is that I often present this and even when I said it earlier I said sadly for us you know because we lose her contributions to physics but the lesson I take away from that is that uh, it's okay to have an amazing contribution and then do something else in your life right there's this weird thing that physics and even in the stories that I tell these people are physicists for life right <laughs> and yet I don't think society works that way and I don't think work works that way anymore we we have more of a you know portfolio career type of pursuit we have things where and there's even it's well documented that a lot of physicists make their greatest contributions in their younger years so why do we leave out the stories of these people just because they didn't work until they were 70 and win a Nobel Prize they still made amazing contributions and they should be recognized, but also, you know, it's every individual's right to choose whether they want to do that for the rest of their life or not. Um, obviously having less financial scarcity and not forcing women to quit when they uh, get married, a, a great, uh, <laughs> great steps forward. But it does, it does really, yeah, bring about this question of who, who gets to be a physicist. And often those are more socioeconomic questions than we would like to admit. Mm -hmm. um so um i want to um ask you about um a, a bit of a counterfactual um for uh having to do with this history so the subtitle of of your book um includes the the improbable experiments that change the world and so um what i'm wondering is if you think that once the wilhelm Röntgen uh found the x-ray or, you know, JJ Thompson found the electron. We still have, you know, 110, 100, uh, yeah, 100, around 115 years um, to, you know, get to this place where we really understand the subatomic, subatomic nature as well as we do with the standard model. Um, what was that inevitable? Meaning that, um, you know, if we, if the, if the characters in your book, besides say those first two, um, weren't born we had we didn't have those, those particular people what could have gone gone wrong I, I guess what i'm saying is um what improbable events had to occur um that that made all of this great uh discovery possible so it's interesting i think there's a couple of aspects of the word improbable and we did um there's actually this is actually a new subtitle for the us canadian version the subtitle for the uk version was um 12 experiments that changed our world and we prevaricated a lot over this new subtitle and even the word improbable so i'm glad that you picked up on it and asked the question because i asked myself i was like oh that's an interesting reflection from my editors inserting the word improbable because that wasn't one that I inserted myself originally. And I thought, well, as you've asked, are these experiments improbable? Are the questions that these people have asked improbable? Would it have been different had we had other other, other people asking those questions? And I think <clears throat> I think the individuals are almost, even though their stories are fascinating, the individuals almost don't matter. It's what is improbable to me is the fact that we have managed as people to create these cultures in which this question asking and experimenting 
um, is uh, possible. And I think it's really important that we've created those cultures, right? Like even university institutions, but these big labs that we now have. I think that that um, aspect is is the improbable one. When, you know, if you think about the other pressures in our lives, uh, whether they be financial or, you know, productivity pushes or, you know, our being accountable to stakeholders and wanting to create products and, you know, all these other pressures that we have as people. Um, and what that speaks to for me is like the same reason why in some ways the fact that, um, you know, even art and music and all these other things could be considered improbable given the other pressures in our lives. And that for me is where I see physics as a sort of cultural activity and um, and a creative activity. And so there's there's a lot wound up in that word improbable for me. And I liked it because it sort of allows me to delve in and go, well, why, yeah, why, why are we allowed to do this? You know, like, <laughs> but just as why am I allowed to write a poem or why am I allowed to, to make music? It's because it's, I'm exploring not just what it means to be a person, but I'm exploring what it means to be in this universe and to understand um, the nature of our own existence. Um, so that's, that's, yeah, it's big, but um, I feel like the word improbable almost encapsulates that just within that one word. Yeah, I, I I like the story that you put in the book of uh, Bob Wilson, physicist and you know, champion of Fermilab, when he was asked by the Senate uh, if Fermilab would contribute to the defense of the country. He said, he said, well, you know, can not I, to can I read it? Can was I read that? it? Oh, please it's such do. a beautiful quote. Can I read it? I actually I always have it marked because I, I come to it a lot. Um, yes, because please. it's just such a beautiful quote. Oh, now now today I haven't got it marked. Hang on. I'll just find it. Two seconds. Um, yeah, because it's in the Tabatron chapter and he's, yeah, he's put in front of the Senate and he's asked, um, yeah, to justify the cost of this big machine. And, you know, at first he sort of says, well, you know, we're going to come up with new technologies because we always do, which was true. Um, the Tabatron led to uh, superconducting wire, which is the reason why we have MRI scanners, as you said. Um, so, but uh, let me just find the second. It's on uh, 220. Um, Thank you. Yeah, the uh, there we go. I got it. I got it. All right. So the senator asks him, um, uh, does it have anything to do with the security of the country? And Wilson just says no, because he worked on the Manhattan Project. He's a pacifist very much at this point. And the senator presses him on it and he says nothing at all. And then Wilson just knocks it out of the park and he says, it has only to do with the respect with which we regard one another, the dignity of man, our love of culture. It has to do with, are we good painters, good sculptors, great poets? I mean, all the things we really venerate in this country and are patriotic about. It has nothing to do directly with defending our country, except to make it worth defending. And I just, ah, oh, every time gives me shivers. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was. Uh, it gave me shivers too. I I, yeah. I also loved it. And uh, I mean, you know, when when you're young and you're trying to um, understand the world, you're starting to get interested in in physics or science, whatever it is. You know, it's it starts with just curiosity. Um, yeah. And so, um, you know, it's not it's not a coincidence that curiosity eventually leads to all of these innovations. Um, but there is something magical about it. Um, yeah. 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 Um, and I think just, yeah, even telling, telling those stories all the way through, like we often have this disjoint between um, our stories about innovation and technology, especially, and our stories about physics and curiosity. There's this, they're always, almost, almost always told separately. And yet, um, you know, there was an economist, Mariano Muzzicato, who analyzed the 12 key technologies in the iPhone to find that all 12 originally came from publicly funded research. And two of them came from CERN, the World Wide Web and touchscreens. So, um, <laughs> it's <not> yeah, bad. <laughs> yeah, it's not a bad, not a bad track record, is it? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, um, maybe I'll, I'll ask one more and then we'll go to the audience for the Q and A. So, um, it, it, you out there in the audience, feel free to drop questions in the Q and A. Um, the, the one question that, uh, I, I foreshadowed wanting to ask earlier was about, um, understanding uh, SARS-CoV-2 and, and its relationship to uh, particle accelerator in the 1940s. So I was just wondering if you could uh, share a bit about that story and, and how, how it was used recently. A very quick run rundown of that story. Yeah, this is a wonderful, like almost serendipitous discovery as well. They were making particle accelerators in industry and it happened at, in GE. It didn't even happen in a you know, national research lab. 
Um, and they there was a, a note sort of came to them that let them know that they may have a limit on the energy of the electron beam in their machine. Um, and so they went looking for what would be the effect of this, which is that it would give out radiation. And at first they didn't find anything. And then they rebuilt their machine in a new way called a synchrotron. And then one day they were trying to operate this machine and it, the technician said, oh, it keeps sparking, um, you know, like turn it off, turn it off, it keeps sparking. And so one of the physicists um, decided, oh, I'm going to watch it while it while it happens. And so they set up this big mirror around the radiation shielding because you couldn't watch it directly. And we're watching it as it was operating. And instead of sparking, what was actually happening was this this light was coming out, this visible light, because they when they rebuilt it, they happened to have um, put a glass vacuum tube in the center instead of a metal one that they'd had before. Um, and it was one of the most beautiful and quick experiments that had ever happened because this theoretical prediction um, of electrons losing energy in this machine was able to predict that the color of the light would change depending on the beam energy in the machine. And so the physicists got the control operator to lower the energy of the beam over time and the color of the light goes from uh, I think it was from blue which was you know the highest energy color all the way down through the spectrum to red and then down to the infrared and disappears from from view and I, I I love that that experiment and this light is called synchrotron light and it's a very specific bright coherent form of light so imagine more like laser light than than something else and we now build entire national facilities just to produce this form of light because it is so, so useful in investigating um, other areas of science. So um, in the UK, there's a national facility called the Diamond Light Source. In Australia, there's the Australian Light Source. I know in the US, there's a number of them as well. Um, and during the pandemic, uh, when SARS-CoV-2 first sort of came around, um, there was a desperate rush to understand the physical structure of the virus and of the proteins within the virus because it turns out and I didn't know this before in such detail but structural biology as a field exists because the physical structure and shape of biological objects is what gives them their function and it's using this technique using um, crystallography is the, the technique that's called where you take diffraction patterns based on um, amounts of these proteins and then using that you can reconstruct at the atomic level and the electron level the structure of these proteins and so while everything else was shut down these facilities went into overdrive measuring the structure of all the different proteins in the SARS-CoV-2 because if you understand the structure you can design a specific drug or vaccine or something else to to counter it so if the mrna and the other ones that were trialed had not worked we would have would have had to um design from the ground up based on the structure a brand new type of vaccine to counter to counter it and they're probably still working on that now and even the mrna research happened at these facilities as well so it it's kind of mind-blowing that this idea that came from a physics lab that actually helped them understand, for example, the production of um, of radio waves out in space in astronomy. It led to a revolution in radio astronomy. Also helps us understand how the structure of viruses and things like that work and, and can lead to new medicines um, based on these national facilities that most people drive past and go, wonder what that is, you know? <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, helping, it's helping with COVID. Um, yeah, yeah. So Alan um, asks, um, how does exposure to ideas and creativity outside our own area of expertise stimulate us and make us more innovative? I would love to know the research on that. I've So since writing the book and realizing this um, incredible uh, story of curiosity and creativity and knowing that a lot of these scientists had interest in other areas, whether that's in the arts or, or things, I, I think there's something in that. But I don't have the research to to prove that. I know that for me, including my sort of creative practice, which is around writing for me, um, definitely uh, shifts the way that I think and shifts the way that I am creative in my scientific work. Um, but I would, uh, if, yeah, if anyone out there has seen the research on it or knows the research or wants to do it, <laughs> um, yeah, I, 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 I feel that your assumption there is correct, but I can't speak to the details because I'm not sure we know. <laughs> I I loved this this story of um uh the the Lawrence brothers who uh, one one was a physicist the other's a doctor and then they were able to um use uh, radioactive phosphorus to uh 
help to with. Treat leukemia at first. Yeah, yeah. But it really it brought about so this production of radioisotopes from the cyclotron, which was the machine that, that Ernest Lawrence invented, um, and then this collaboration with his brother who comes over the su summer to do some pretty rubbish but very important experiments using using mice, um, leads to this idea that these radioactive isotopes can be used in small quantities in the body to trace out to either trace out things like metabolic, highly metabolic regions and the function of, say, the thyroid or the heart, um, or to deliver radiation to specific regions as well. Um, and the whole field of nuclear medicine really came from that little, yeah, cross-disciplinary collaboration between two brothers, which, um, yeah, of course, since then, you know, people try and recreate that all the time. And there's many um, collaborations between especially physics and medicine. And that's that's the area in which I collaborate most strongly as well. Um, Margaret asks, has the increased speed of electronics and machine computation pr provided specific tools that led to some recent discoveries? Do they play a role with, comp you know, improved computation in um, discoveries? Yeah, I mean, so just the advent of like large scale computing and parallel computing and now um, grid computing and cloud computing and all of that. Um, <clears throat> was absolutely essential to uh, all the discoveries that have been made in recent years in particle physics. And that's why um, Tim Berners-Lee invented the World Wide Web at CERN was to share data um, between the many different collaborating scientists because he knew that no single you know, computer or no single repository of that data was going to be sufficient um, for everyone to sort of access from abroad and analyze and then <clears throat> so finding more distributed ways was the motivation behind him um, creating the World Wide Web and putting it in the public domain in the first place. Um, and of course, there's now more innovations in that space as well. And um, scientists in these areas are always looking for the newest, best tools with which to work and even creating them if they don't exist already. So there's some really interesting stuff happening in machine learning and AI space at the moment that some of my colleagues are working on with, um, you know, instead of telling or training or, or um, creating an algorithm to look for specific things in the data from, say, the Large Hadron Collider, can you train an AI or use machine learning to look for things that you might not expect to sort of go beyond our um, our usual ways of analyzing, uh, even if at first we don't understand why the data looks like that, just using these new techniques to find to find something there and go, hmm, that's new, uh, is really what you're looking for. Is that that very reaction of, hmm, I didn't expect that. Um, so so yeah, it's, there's always this sort of cutting edge uh, technology usage within the field. Um, I'm going to jump in. Uh, there's there's one question since we're uh, we're nearing the end. We just have a few more minutes. I wanted to ask about um, the future, which is the last chapter of your book. Mm -hmm. um, you you give some hints of uh, future colliders, plasma accelerators. So I was just mm -hmm. wondering if you could give us a, a sneak peek of what's to come in the field. Yeah, I mean, obviously, I obviously I don't decide, but um, there are international processes which decide um both in europe and the americas and in asia uh which decide their priorities for what they'd like to look for and um what those priorities are at the moment in most of those regions is to build um a big uh probably linear but potentially circular electron positron collider at first which can do precision measurements on things like the higgs boson and being able to have those precise measurements might lead us to understanding of, for example, what dark matter is through, I mean, that sounds unexpected, right? But there's um, a lot of the theories that uh, include dark matter. Um, there's effects that play out in the interactions of the Higgs boson from the existence of dark matter. And so you could look for those things. But the current colliders, the proton, proton colliders, are way too messy to do that. So we would need a precision machine some of those ideas are like ready to go, ready to build. Um, and it's just awaiting whether or not funding comes through and whether or not there's enough scientific motivation and they sort of know what they're looking for sufficiently to build it. Um, but there are other ideas and technologies coming along the line. So one idea would be, be to build, and this has sort of come back into the zeitgeist in the last couple of years. This is really, um, you know, hot off the, the conferences is that people are now reconsidering the idea of building a muon collider. Um, where yeah, where you smash muons together, which are also precise, but they um, 
but they don't radiate as much as electrons. So you can make the machine physically smaller than you would um, for an electron machine. But they're very, very short-lived. And that's the challenge is producing them. And then you have to cool them down and condense the beam down and then get them to collide in like fractions of a second. <laughs> and that's very, very challenging. So there's with each new idea comes new challenges. The plasma accelerators are a particularly exciting one. Um, and there's just been uh, a really interesting result uh, come out of a CERN experiment called AWAKE, which is where they're using a proton accelerator, they're smashing that into a gas um, chamber full of rubidium that sets up a sort of plasma wave which has such strong electric fields that you can then inject an electron beam in and that electron beam gets accelerated the key is the plasma is already broken down electrically so you're not limited by sparking and breakdowns which normally limits the um the sort of length of other machines now this is really early days it's still very much in the experimental phase of trying to understand the physics to get it working but they did just have a, a little breakthrough which is that they've realized they can get the protons that set up this wave to do it in such a way and to control it in such a way that they can really control how the electron beam is accelerated and they didn't know they could do that at first so it's been um a lot of learning in the physics of the plasma and the physics of all the beam interactions with that plasma um so that's what's exciting me at the moment is i'm looking at that going oh that's like getting exciting but in all likelihood we're going to end up combining these newer ideas with conventional or more conventional technologies in order to build the next the next big thing um yeah so there's so many options but really the decision at the moment is sort of linear or circular and exactly which technology we use. Um, there are some pretty far off ideas about building ones on the moon and out in space. I don't think they're getting off the ground anytime soon. <laughs> um, it sounds, yeah, it sounds like a lot of exciting stuff um, in our future. So that's, that's optimistic. Um, I know that we're at the hour, but we got one uh, very fun question here at the end. So let, let's just do a quick lightning one um, mm -hmm. and, and we'll end it with that, which is from Rob who asks, um, uh, in your current work in the field of physics, what keeps you up at night? What makes you curiouser and curiouser? Ooh, um, so my current work is actually further on the applied uh, end between physics and medicine. I think um, what keeps me up at night is uh, the fact that these high tech technologies aren't equitably accessible in the world. So we can create amazing technologies to do things like treat cancer, but unless they can be built and maintained in the areas where people need them, which in is, is a growing need in lower middle income countries, then it's not going to work. So, uh, so that's what keeps me up at night is how can you have technologies which are both cutting edge and do amazing things in the world, but also get them to reach areas that are currently underserved. So that's Thanks less of a physics much. worry, but that's what keeps me up at night. <laughs> no, it's uh, important. So thank you so much. I very much enjoyed it. And I'll pass it um, back to uh, you now. Thanks, right. Greg. Thank you. Thank you so much to, to both of you, to Greg and Susie, and uh, thanks to all of you watching and listening in for joining us. The uh, link to purchase copies of the book from Harvard Bookstore is in the chat. Um, thank you so much for uh, supporting your local or maybe not local uh, independent bookstore if you're if you're joining us from from wherever you may be. Um, uh, on behalf of Harvard Bookstore and the Harvard Division of Science and the Cabot Science Library, um, have a good night. Um, or um, there could be Australia, whatever time zone you're in. Have a have a <laughs> lovely day. Uh, stay well and uh, keep reading. And thank you so much again to uh, Greg and Susie. Thank you. Thanks, Nell. Thanks, everyone, for coming. Bye.